The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Glory, Glory to you, o Lord. Lord. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, <coughs> excuse me, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when that star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there, ahead of them, went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with great joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and they paid homage. Then opening their treasure chest, they offered them, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in, in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the gospel. Of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. We are celebrating the Epiphany of our Lord this day. Now, when a, an ancient king was born and was announced to the world, it was his Epiphany, it was his coming out, it was the enlightenment that he was to be king and ruler. Epiphany means manifestation. God is revealed to us. The hidden God is revealed to us. Now in this tradition of Epiphany, it, the church tradition involves three events in the life of Christ. The Magi visit that we are experiencing today in the scriptures, the baptism of our Lord, which we will experience next week in the scriptures. And last but not least, the wedding at Cana of Galilee. That will be our third time that we witness this epiphany happening in the, in the upcoming weeks, in this season of epiphany. Now all three of these events in the life of Jesus, all of them reveal Jesus' deity. The Magi followed that star which led them to Bethlehem. And we talked earlier in the announcement time today about how God has led us all to this place. And there's no way you can sit around if we sat around during coffee time, fellowship time afterwards, and tried to pinpoint exactly why it is we came to this place. I think all of us would come to the conclusion that God has brought us to this place. And so that reveals Jesus' deity, this visit by the Magi. Jesus' baptism, the heavens opened wide open, and there was a voice that came from heaven that said, This is my Son. And Jesus' deity was announced at his baptism. At the wedding, the miracle, God is revealed, and the disciples believe in him through this miracle of turning water into wine. There, there are some, uh, these three events in the life of Jesus also show that God has come to dwell with us, which was the prophecy that we heard in Advent and what we saw happen on Christmas Eve. 
For the Magi, Jesus isn't in a palace. Jesus, this King of the Jews, is not in Herod's palace in Jerusalem. This King is not in all of his royal glory sitting in a palace. He is dwelling with us. At Jesus' baptism, Jesus steps right into that murky, muddy Jordan River water. And Jesus is with us. At the wedding, Jesus is celebrating with the people. He's in, he's, he's in the culture of the people, and he's meeting basic needs within the culture. All three of these events fulfill the prophecy that God is here, and that God is here to make a difference in our lives, a difference in the world. Jesus will make a difference in the whole, in the culture and society of the day, and even today, Jesus makes a difference in our culture and society, in the lives of individual people. And as we go through the gospel, through the epiphany season, we will see how it is that Jesus made a difference in everyone that he touched. And there's a difference for God himself. Do you remember how we, we went over how that God was moved? God was moved, and God moved for us, coming from his heavenly throne, to be here and to be the mender of that broken relationship with God's people. So there's trouble brewing here in this gospel scripture today. We hear that King Herod and all of Jerusalem was troubled by what had happened, by this announcement that there was a king. Everybody was a little bit on edge at this announcement. There is uncertainty about this new power that has come on the scene. It's seen by King Herod as an undermining of his authority. I mean, when you stop and think about it, there are rulers coming from the, from the east. There are rulers coming from other nations, wise men coming from, from afar to meet this new king. And God's light is revealing something that has been hidden. Jesus is here and he's tipping the balance of power and Herod is afraid. He trembles. A king, the king of the Jews, King Herod, was supposed to take care of his people. That was his job. And if he doesn't keep the people fed and clothed, and there's an uprising against, against him, then Rome is going to step in because they don't like trouble. So here is the king of the Jews that the heavens are declaring. The psalmist tells us the heavens declare the glory of God. And the heavens are marking the fact that the king of the Jews is here, that, that, that the king is here. God himself is here. And when those heavens mark that very fact, King Herod feels like he's going to be replaced, and he's threatened. So Epiphany is good news for the folks who have been oppressed by the government, who have been oppressed, those who feel like they don't have a place in this world, in society. Epiphany is good news for those who know that Christ has come to set us free. But after all, God's people have sat in darkness long enough, and it seems that the godless power has been in the spotlight for too long. Jesus will turn the table the first will be last, and the last will be first in his teaching. The kingdom of God will be revealed through Jesus Christ. I saw a quote uh, this past weekend that it's from Bob Goff. Jesus spent his whole life engaging the people most of us have spent our whole lives trying to avoid. And Jesus will turn those tables and, and, and show us that the first will be last and the last will be first. This is good news for those who are oppressed. This is really good news for all people as the angels, as the angels announced to the shepherds on the plain 
this good news is for all people. So it's really good news that the light has come and shined for us and shone for us. It's really good news until the flashlight comes on us, right? Jesus will step on some toes in his ministry, and he will name injustices that people don't consider themselves being a part of, not welcoming those who he engages, those people that we try to avoid, the cultural rituals, not sitting with the leper, not breaking bread with the prostitutes of the day as Jesus did, and God forbid, especially in this tax season, sitting with a tax collector of all people. These things that are just not right within that culture of that day. And we think of the things that are taboo in our culture today. Jesus turns those tables. Jesus gives worth to every human being in this world. That is what the good news is. This light that is shining is indiscriminate after all. It shines on all. If God's grace is for all people, God's light will shine in all of those corners of our lives. I like to think of it as being, <laughs> if you're in a restaurant late at night or maybe a bar or somewhere, and they turn the house lights on, <laughs> and all of a sudden, <laughs> You see those spots where, well, maybe we don't want the lights on those corners. You see the food that is stuck in the corner. Or at home, it's just like a, a, a child opening that forbidden closet that you've got everything stuffed in when company is there. <laughs> and all of a sudden, oh no, you know, you're revealing something. And the spotlight is on the junk that you have in the corner in the closet. That's exactly what God's light does for all people because God is here to make a difference. We will hear in the coming weeks Jesus telling his disciples, come and follow me. You want a life changer? Come and follow me. He comes up to them at the docks where they are fishing. Now it's remarkable that the disciples followed him. They didn't say, hey, wait a minute, we were here first and you're the stranger in our land. You know, we know what we're doing. We're in charge here with, with the docks, and, and we know what we're doing in our vocation. No, they said, we will follow you in obedience to him. We find out that God did follow us and move for us and came to dwell with us. God is here, and God is here to make a difference. So that now that we know that God is here and we're in this epiphany season, and if we know that God is going to be walking down the sidewalk on Pleasure Road here, and God is going to come through those red doors today, if we knew that with at least five minutes notice in advance, we probably have a wish list for God, wouldn't we? We probably have a huge wish list. Probably all of us sitting here right now in this moment have at least one thing that we would love God to change for our lives, change for the outside environment that affects our life. Maybe it's a, a, a neighbor that we're having trouble with. Maybe it's sickness that we're having trouble with. Maybe our loved ones, we care for our loved ones and we don't want our loved ones to be sick or die. We care for employment and unemployment for those who we love, and we ask for that to be changed. We've got our one, two, three, four to ten list for God. We've got that list, and we want God to change that for us. The people who encounter Jesus, they'll bring beds of people to Jesus to be healed. They have these lists for things where they need change in their life. But very rarely, very rarely in our wish list that we have, maybe somewhere down on number 25 or so possibly, God 
changed me. We very rarely would say, God, I want to be changed, or I need to be changed. Come and change my life, God. We're always looking to those outside factors for where the problem is. What in the world is wrong with this world? And we start to list what is wrong with this world. We are oppressed by King Herod. Maybe our educational system, our health care system in this world. How, how about this one? Parents just don't teach their children like they should anymore. It's always someone else's problem that is going on. And very rarely, and I'm preaching to myself, shall I say I'm preaching to the choir too. <laughs> I'm preaching to myself when I say very rarely do we pull that full body mirror out and look in that mirror and say, maybe it's me that needs to ask to be changed by God. Because after all, and we heard this in Advent, that God came to individual people. God came to the Virgin Mary to make a change in this world, to be the vessel. God came to the shepherds to be, be the bearers of good news, one relationship at a time. God has called us to be that instrument of change, one relationship at a time. As pastor, I often hear people say to me, Pastor, I think that the church should do this. I think that, Pastor, you should do this. And just recently I said, well, there's something right over there in the corner. Why don't you be the element of change here and the instrument of change? You lead this change. You be the instrument. Jesus is here to tip that torch of light toward us so we can light the world with the light of God one relationship at a time. We have our wish lists for God and we have our terms of negotiation for God. We really want to tell God who is in charge of our lives. And that all boils down to something called sin. I have this analogy of, and this is a funny analogy for me because I am, I am scared to death of water that is over my head. I do not swim. But I can imagine being in a canoe. And I can imagine I'm the one in the canoe and I have perfect balance of that canoe. And if I don't have balance of that canoe, it's gonna tip over and I'm gonna die because I don't know how to swim. And it's almost like Jesus coming to us and saying, hey, I've got one more person to add to the canoe. Or I've got two more people. I've got three people to add to the canoe. And I say, no, no, I have control of this canoe. And I know what's going on, God. And in this analogy, Jesus says, I have others to share the good news with. I have others who need to be in this canoe. I will help you balance this canoe. And Jesus knew a lot about water with his disciples. He was out there on the sea with them in some tough, tough water. And Jesus was always with them. God is with us in all times of our life to make that change with us. God is here to meet us in those tough times, to make the impossible possible. God will not forsake us. That is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ revealed to us. God is here for good, to dwell among us, to walk with us through change, to lead us down that pathway not necessarily God works through the desires of our hearts, but sometimes not necessarily to light the path that we want to go on. We give God orders about where we want to go on this path, 
oftentimes God leads us a light to go down another path for his glory. God knows what God is doing. And God is amazing. And it's amazing that God has chosen each and every one of us to be a part of God's work in this world. What an amazing God we serve. Praise be to God this day.